You're listening to Cover Your Assets, a podcast that discusses the timely and significant legal issues faced by employers. Kathleen Jennings is an attorney who has over 30 years of experience in advising employers as to their legal responsibilities and has written extensively about employment law in her popular Cover Your Assets blog. If your business has employees, you cannot afford not to have your assets covered. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Cover Your Assets. And this is a podcast that is a companion piece to the Cover Your Assets blog that is written by someone I know very well, my sister, Kathleen Jennings. Kathleen, uh, why don't we start this off by you telling us a little bit about your legal background, what the impetus was for the Cover Your Assets written blog, and then we'll shift right into our topic of the day, which is, I believe, OSHA inspections. Well, Tom, thank you very much. And it is a pleasure to be here with you, my favorite brother, doing a podcast, as we've talked about doing for how long has it been now? Months? Years? Decades? Millenniums? I don't know. We've been talking about it for quite some time. We have been talking about it, so I'm glad we finally got around to doing it. I am an attorney. I'm licensed in Georgia and New York. I went to New York University School of Law on, uh, for law school, and I went to Cornell University undergrad, and I practice labor and employment law on management side, which means I represent companies that have issues concerning their employees. Any issues that could be anything from wage and hour to safety to sexual harassment, discrimination, any of those things. So, I mean, the reality is to cover your assets blog and, of course, your area of expertise when it comes to law, this this is something that would be targeted towards whom? It's targeted toward businesses that want to get a little information about the laws that apply to them are just best practices with regard to handling employee issues. I like writing and I thought that a blog would be a great platform for me to give some information to people out there about the latest cases or developments in the law, Uh, something like the OSHA emergency temporary standard is something that I've been writing about a lot. And COVID, as we all know, has presented a lot of new and different issues for employers. So I've done a lot of writing on that as well. And as much as the name Cover Your Assets is kind of meant to be a little bit, you know, I don't know what you call it, kind of kind of funny tongue in cheek, the reality is, is that as an employer, if you do have an issue related to employee safety or discrimination complaints, anything like that, it could make the difference between profitability, staying in business, or even, I guess, from a public relations standpoint, they, these are the types of things that you really have to pay attention to because they could cause serious damage to your assets and or your business, correct? Absolutely. And let's just backtrack and let me give uh, credit where credit is due. The name Cover Your Assets was the brainchild of my favorite brother, Tom Jennings. So I thank you very much for that. And you are absolutely correct. Uh, a, an employment discrimination or a wage and hour case or any kind of litigation in, involving employees can be very expensive. Even if you win, it's expensive. And if you lose, uh, it's, it's even worse and absolutely can have a devastating impact on your company's reputation on your ability to hire new employees even, especially now where the job market is so tight. And most of all, you know, your assets are your employees. They are your biggest asset. And if you don't treat them right, you're going to have a hard time finding and keeping good ones. And ultimately, this is, is really about proactivity because the reactivity, it, that's, that's it, if you, if, I feel like if you come in and there's something that has happened, now you're in reaction mode, which I believe you and I were talking about. You just had a case where you went to a place in Washington, D.C. where they had had an accident. So now you're dealing with OSHA with that. But the reality is, is that even as an attorney, 
you're advising clients on how to be proactive. Is that correct? Absolutely, because proactive in the long run should save you money and also protect you against accidents, litigation, and just uh, other issues like poor morale, uh, too much turnover, any of those things. So the proactive employer is the employer that truly does cover their assets better than the reactive employer. Now, sometimes things happen and, and through your best efforts, they happen and you couldn't have stopped it. And sometimes we have to be reactive on those things. But it's good to plan ahead, sort of plan for the worst, hope for the best. All right. Well, here's a here's a question. And so I own a business and OSHA has said that they're going to come and inspect. I'm doing everything correctly. I shouldn't have to worry about it. Why would I need an attorney? I mean, if I'm doing everything right. Well, first of all, Tom, uh, keep in mind that OSHA doesn't normally tell you when they show up. One day they may just show up at your door because it's either a programmed inspection of uh, your particular industry or more likely it's a complaint from an employee that is um, given to OSHA. They come in to inspect the complaint or it can be a workplace incident, an accident, an injury or hopefully not a fatality. And they're going to come in and they're going to investigate that. But they're not going to call you up in advance and say, hey, I'm your OSHA inspector. I'm going to show up and inspect your plant. So just get ready for me. They don't do that. They they want to show up. They want the element of surprise in their favor. So why do you need an attorney? Because you have a right to an attorney. Every company has a right to an attorney. And unfortunately, too many companies don't uh, avail themselves of that right. And they think that they can just talk their way out of any kind of citations that the ocean inspector may issue or that the area office may issue. And the reality is that OSHA inspectors, some of them will take advantage of employers that don't have counsel present. And they may expand the inspection beyond what they have probable cause to inspect. So at what point do you come in on the process? You said that the ocean inspector just shows up unannounced. I mean, I was in the restaurant industry for many years. I mean, I guess it probably similar situation with the health inspector to make sure the temps are right on all your food and all that kind of stuff. So are you called as soon as the ocean inspector shows up and then do they have to wait for the inspection or do they just have the right to go in and do what they have to do? Normally the ocean, I'll get called when the ocean inspector shows up and if an attorney can get there in a reasonable amount of time, then they'll have to wait for the attorney to get there. So uh, let's you know let's finish up because I think ultimately when it comes to these types of things, OSHA inspections, and we've we've kind of given a lot of just information. Can you give me a case study, one that kind of comes to mind that that maybe will show people the proactive side and or the reactive side, but if nothing else, just kind of the importance of having legal counsel involved in the process and how maybe you saved a company's assets by being there. Well, Tom, have I ever told you about the first OSHA inspection that I ever attended? Uh, Yeah, I think it was about an hour ago when we were preparing for the show. And I was hoping that it would just come off as very simultaneous and like, uh, well, well, no, not simultaneous. What's the word? Spontaneous. Spontaneous. Yes, but but here we are. Yes. So I, I don't know if I said no, I'd never heard. But, you know, you are an attorney, so you kind of backed me into a corner. So you know the answer is yes. I heard about it about an hour ago, which is why I threw that softball question to you. But I didn't actually tell you about the inspection, did I? Well, you told me a little bit about the inspection. Now, see, now this is why you need an attorney because you notice how, even though, but there's a little bit of this sort of brother sister thing. So you know me. So you, you're backing me into a corner. Yes, I am. It's what I do. <laughs> it's what you do. It's what I do. All right. Well, go ahead. Why don't you share the the full story of the first OSHA inspection? That I ever attended. That you ever yes. attended. And did I ever tell you about the first OSHA inspection that I ever attended? You haven't attended any. That's true. <laughs> so you caught me on that one. So See, we're not going to talk about. Yeah, there you go. All right. So go ahead. Let's get to that first ocean okay. inspection. Well, let's talk about the first ocean inspe- inspection that I attended because it happened 
I don't even know how many years ago it was, but I was called in because an OSHA inspector had shown up on a complaint issue. And one of my colleagues had gotten into, a, a, I guess, an argument with him and threw him out. So then the OSHA inspector came back with a warrant. And rather than st- send the colleague that had argued with him back down, I was sent over to interact with this OSHA inspector who happened to be fresh out of the Marines where he had been a drill sergeant. So he was feeling pretty frisky and he had this warrant and he decided that he was going to inspect the entire facility, even though he didn't really have a reason to, but he had a warrant. So we couldn't stop him at that point. So this inspection, he walked around with me for 14 hours looking at everything because he thought he was going to wear me down and he didn't. And then finally, we agreed upon a time when we would finish because I get a little cranky when I don't have sleep. (laughs) Yeah, I have a quick question. So sure. you mentioned the fact that the ocean inspector had a warrant to be able to inspect yeah. the entire facility. So without a warrant, how much leeway does an OSHA inspector have to inspect a, a facility? And at what point could you advise your client or your client could say, no, you can't inspect this portion of the operation without a warrant? Normally, the OSHA inspector can inspect what he or she has probable cause to inspect depending upon the impetus for the inspection. So if it's a complaint inspection, then they're going to look, they they have probable cause to inspect the area in which uh, the complaint arose. Or if there's an accident, they have probable cause to inspect the area where the accident occurred. To get a wall-to-wall, which is what we call the inspection of the whole facility, some of those are programmed inspections, which means They rotate among different companies in the industry and and look at the entire facility wall to wall. Uh, Some some industries get that more than others because there's a lot of safety issues. So on something like a complaint investigation, they shouldn't have probable cause to inspect the entire facility wall to wall. And what OSHA inspectors will also do is keep in mind when they come into your facility, not only are they inspecting what is arising or out of or close to the complaint or the accident, anything they see in plain sight, they can cite you for if there's a hazard that you haven't done anything about. So you want to limit their access to those kinds of things and you want to clean things up before they get there if you can. So what happened with that particular, you said you got into, it was a 14 hour inspection and I mean, how, what was the end result? And again, what was your role in terms of maybe mitigating circumstances in the favor of the employer or just maybe making it a little bit better for them? Well, he and I reached an agreement as to when he would leave uh, and come back the next day, if that's what he wanted to do. And then we got to that point and he said he was going to continue inspecting. And I looked him in the eye and I said, you are a Marine, are you not? And he said, yes. And I said, well, isn't your honor important as a Marine? He said, yes. I said, well, you gave me your word that you were going to be out of here at this particular time. So are you telling me that you are not a man of your word and not a man of honor? So he left. In the meantime, folks in my office were going to court to quash the warrant So when he came back the next day, I had the pleasure of telling him that he couldn't come back in. Oh, nice. Well, and again, I, like you said, I mean, sometimes giving an employer the benefit of the doubt, there may be a violation that they're not entirely aware of, but I think that maybe speaks to the importance of as an employer, you really have to be aware of the OSHA rules and regulations and have some internal controls to make sure that you're not committing any violations. And do you consult with clients on that as well? Do you ever go through and maybe explain to them the types of things that they need to be doing so that they're in compliance? Absolutely. I've done inspections of a facility looking for the kinds of things that OSHA might cite them for. That way they can clean them up 
and not get cited by OSHA if OSHA does in fact show up. All right. And let's, you know, let's go, let's wrap this up because I think we've had some, some great information. And I know at the beginning of the podcast, we mentioned that much of this was related to COVID, but even beyond that, I think COVID may have just drawn attention to the necessity of making sure that you're in compliance with every laws and that they change. So in terms of COVID, what are some of the challenges that employers maybe need to keep an eye out for and some things that you've dealt with in regard to the pandemic and compliance with the different rules and regulations that seem to change every minute? Well, OSHA will still come out and what they want employers to do is follow the guidance that is on OSHA's webpage. Most of it is based upon CDC guidance. Up until a couple weeks ago, OSHA had issued an emergency temporary standard that applied to employers with 100 or more employees. That is now gone. It was stayed by the U.S. Supreme Court, and then the administration withdrew the ETS, which is what we call it. So that's no longer there. But OSHA can still enforce hazards related to COVID under its general duty clause which is sort of a catch-all that they use when there's not a specific section in OSHA law that covers a particular hazard. So it's important to be familiar with their guidance. The guidance targets different industries and follow that guidance. It has to do with physical distancing, mask wearing, things like that. What we found early in the pandemic was that some employees who are also familiar that OSHA's out there enforcing this law, would call in complaints, unfortunately with the hope that it would bring in an OSHA inspector and maybe shut down the plant for a day so they could get a day off. And that was not very successful because during COVID, a lot of OSHA inspectors did not do in-person inspections, but they're doing those now. So if your employees are aware of these standards, that means they're aware, they're aware that they can call OSHA and make a complaint and their identity is never disclosed and they're protected from retaliation. So it's important to, to follow these procedures, follow the guidance so that if OSHA does show up, you can show them all the steps that you're taking to protect your employees from infection by COVID. Excellent. All right. So let's wrap this up. Uh, How about some contact information? I know we'll put some stuff in the, in the show notes so that people can get in touch with you, but uh, how can people get in touch with you if they have further questions or maybe they want to retain your services? People can go to the cover your assets blog. They can contact me by my email, which is probably the easiest kjj at wimlaw.com. All right. And of course, you can subscribe to the written blog as well, and you'll be able to subscribe to the podcast. And if you find something in here, please don't forget to subscribe and share. And if you've got some ideas, some topics and whatnot, I'm sure that you'd be happy to address them and we can go from there. Well, Tom, have you subscribed to the written blog yet? On the advice of counsel, I will plead my fifth amendment. Is Is that how it goes? Something like that? So uh, I will, though. I will, though, because I know you're going to ask me again. And if I say no, then it will be very awkward. So you know that you will have one more subscriber before the end of the show. And it will be it will be your favorite brother, which is, in fact, it's in fact me. But anyhow, uh, this was a great time. Hopefully people enjoy it. I know I certainly enjoyed it. I'm uh, just so you know that I'm in Western New York near Buffalo, New York. And of course, you are right now recording from the lovely state of Georgia. I am. So, so great. Uh, Hopefully at some point, you know, you can visit down here because Tom, it's warmer in Georgia than it is in Western New York this time of year. (laughs) All right. Duly noted. But again, everybody, thank you so much for listening to the inaugural episode of the Cover Your Assets podcast. And what a fantastic name that is, isn't it? It's a great name, Tom. Whoever came up with that is a genius. All right. Fantastic. All right, until next time, this is your host, Tom Jennings, and of course, with my expert sister, Kathleen.